Any Jayek, welcome back to, um, well, uh, this will be our new session, our new book club. And so today we are, we are reviewing Heartberries by Therese Marie Melhot. I know this is mirrored and I don't know how to fix that. So, um, but I'll put a link for it in the description box. Um, so if you don't have it yet, you can get it. It's really, really good. So if you were with me in our Braiding Sweetgrass book club, before we get started, I like to just get centered so that we're focused and we're, we are um, not multitasking and thinking about a bunch of different stuff. Um, so I personally smudge, but do whatever is appropriate for your culture or just your personal preference um, to get centered. And then we'll just take two big deep breaths together. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I've already smudged. Um, I always make sure I have uh, one of my favorite drinks of choice. Today it's just water because it is really, really hot. So um, just make sure you're all centered. Um, I have a drink, of course my book. The door is closed and I've smudged. Now we're just gonna take two really big deep breaths and then we'll do an introduction. Let's go. Perfect. Okay, let's get started. So for those who are new to my channel or just came across this channel or joining us for the first time, my name is Jody Gazaudasot Matina. I am a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. It's an Anishinaabe Bodewatomi and Loon Clan. In many ways, I'm still reconnecting and I think we all will um, for a very long time. So as I'm learning, I am doing a lot of reading and I'm just sharing some thoughts with all of you. It kind of started, um, this book club started when um, COVID was happening because we couldn't meet in town for our book club anymore. And I was just doing a lot more reconnecting. It was really a great time for that. So um, we started the Writing Sweetgrass book club on YouTube and it went well, so I'm just gonna continue it. Um, the Braiding Sweetgrass, there was 15 or 16 episodes, so um, it took quite a long time. We really um, dissected every chapter. Um, today we are doing Heartberries. It's not as long. It's like 127 pages, I think, um, but it's very, very raw. It is very, very deep. It talks about the, it's a memoir. It's Therese Marie Mahot's uh, memoir of her life as an indigenous woman. I believe she was probably on, um, I'm not exactly sure what tribe she is, but and I could be totally wrong, but I believe her tribe is on um, the Pacific Northwest, could be wrong. Anyway, just her life growing up um, on the res as a child during the, you know, the 70s era, um, kind of that's it when aim movement and there was a lot of there was a lot of issues going on a lot of waking up at the same time though um, but it does I mean it goes into some sexual abuse physical abuse alcoholism and basically how she overcame that and um, she ended up um, becoming institutionalized I think it probably it looks like twice um, which there's no shame in that. We have all got mental health problems. I don't care where you came from. We all have issues. Um, but just her walk through that, and it starts almost as a letter or a journal that she is writing to her her lover, her ex-husband, the love of her life, very codependent relationship. Um, I believe, you know, Native women are in in Hollywood are very sexualized and it's part of the cause of the MMIW, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women um, issue is they're de we're dehumanized and highly sexualized. So then we're put out like we're almost supposed to be dolls 
and she felt this to an extreme, of course, because she grew up on the res. Those of us that didn't grow up on reservations or we were known as city Indians, um, our experience is just different. Um, no, no one is better or it's just different. So she had a different experience than I was used to, but I think we can, at least I can, I could really, really relate to so many things she was talking about. So there was a couple times I did have to stop reading the book and just take a breath and cry a little bit. So if you need to do that, or you did do that, you know, let's share, we're all in this together. Um, and it's okay. I read this book in, you know, on a weekend. We were actually driving to the Pokegon Reservation in Michigan, in Dawajiak, Michigan, and I read it then, and it, it was almost, in a way, it was a perfect time for me to read it because I was going back to my people's homeland, and so it was, it was pretty neat. Um, I do have PTSD, and I have been sexually abused, and I know the effects of alcoholism in family. So I was worried that this book would be very, very triggering for me. Um, so I kind of had, I didn't read it alone. Like I was in the car with my husband when I was reading it in the hotel. Um, it wasn't triggering in a way it was liberating because here's this woman, very successful award novelist woman who's, I think she's made her, she has a PhD or at least a master's degree in her field native woman born in, on the res who overcame all of this. I don't know if overcome is the right word. Um, she still thrived. She still survived. She still healed um, and broke a lot of cycles while doing that and then shared her journey with all of us. And it's so raw. Like she just opened up her soul for all of us to see and I feel like that was so brave of her. So I hope I do her justice. I'm going to read some passages and then I really want to know your thoughts on it. I'll share my thoughts as well, but I really would like to know your thoughts. So drop them in the comments and let's discuss. So I want to read this little part. Um, it's the very first um, part of the book. It's page number three, Indian Condition. My story was maltreated. The words were too wrong and ugly to speak. I tried to sell, tell someone my story, but he thought it was a hustle. He marked it as a solicitation. The man took me shopping with his pity. I was silenced by charity. Like so many Indians, I kept my hand out. My story became the hustle. Women asked me what my end game was. I hadn't thought about it. I considered marrying one of the men and sitting with my winnings, but I was too smart to sit. I took their money and went to school. I was hungry and took more. When I gained the faculty to speak my story, I realized I had given men too much. The thing about women from the river is that our currents are endless. We sometimes outrun ourselves. I stopped answering men's questions or their calls. Women asked me for my story. I loved this part. Women asked me for my story. Men took too much, and women asked me for my story. And I think we need to think about that a little bit more. As women, when we come together for each other, with true compassion, with no ego, we can do remarkable things. But I think our jealousy and our egos get in the way too much, and then it just turns into a mess. Or it can be, not all the time. So that that one sentence, women asked me for my story. Men, clearly when you read the book, men wanted sex and they wanted her as a trophy and they wanted her on a pedestal to admire and um, fantasize about. Women just wanted her true story. And I thought that was remarkable. Um, let me know what you thought about that in the comments and let's discuss. And moving on, my grandmother told me about Jesus. We knelt to pray. She told me to close my eyes. It was the only thing she asked me to do properly. She had conviction, but she also taught me to be mindless. We started recipes and lost track. We forgot ingredients. Our cakes never rose. 
We started an applehead doll. The shrunken carved head sat on the bookshelf years after she left. When she died, nobody noticed me. Indian girls can be forgotten so well they forget themselves. Um, I felt that was really important to read too. So it started kind of at childhood for her, feeling invisible and alone. Now I want to read this next part. Um, it's on page six. It's too ugly to speak this story. It sounds like a beggar. How could misfortune follow me so well? And why did I choose it every time? I learned how to make a honey reduction of the ugly sentences. Still, my voice cracks. I love the way that she speaks through this book. It is like a book of poetry, even though it's a memoir. Her analogies and her descriptions are in and of itself just so incredible. And there's so many times where I can't find the words to describe my thoughts or feelings, but somehow she can, and she does a remarkable job of it. So I just wanted to, you know, make note about that. I packed my baby and left my reservation. I came from the mountains to an infinite and flat brown to bur bury my grief. I left because I was hungry. In my first writing class, my professor told me that the human condition was misery. I'm a river widened by misery, and the potency of my language is more than human. It's an Indian condition to be proud of survival, but reluctant to call it resilience. Resilience seems ascribed to a human conditioning in white people. The Indian condition is my grandmother. She was a nursery teacher. There are stories that she brought children to our kitchen, gave them laxatives, and then newspaper on the ground. She squatted before them and made faces to illustrate how hard they should push. The dewormed children this way, she dewormed children this way, and she learned that in residential school, where parasites and nuns and priests contaminated generations of our people. Indians froze trying to run away, and many starved. Nuns and priests ran out of place, places to put bones. So they built us into the walls of new boarding schools. This is kind of um, interesting that we're, we're rereading what we've known for so long about these boarding schools and the way that Therese puts this into words. I mean, there's no better way to put it than she did. I'll go on. I can see grandmother's face in front of those children her hands felt like rose petals, and her eyes were soft and round like buttons. She liked carnations and canned milk. She transcended resilience and actualized what Indians weren't taught to know. We are unmovable. Time seems measured by grief and anticipatory grief. I don't think she even measured time. That one paragraph was like incredible to me to describe her grandmother who like the, the biggest people in my life that have helped make me who I am or who are like the great pillars in my life. I call them my great giants. Like my uncle was my giant. My grandpa, my dad's or my mom's dad was my first giant. My dad became my giant. Um, and so I love how like her grandmother is clearly to me one of her giants one of those people is there for her her hands felt like rose petals we are unmovable and time seems measured by grief and anticipatory grief i don't think she even measured time i i would really like to know your interpretation of that or what you feel about that um I want to try to get this all done in one session, so I'm going to keep going. It shouldn't take too long because these are just my thoughts, but I, I'm really hoping we can spend some time on your thoughts in the comments. So drop your comments and let's have a discussion. Okay, I'm on page, I'm going to jump to page 12 now. So now she's writing a letter to Casey. That is, it's probably a pseudonym. 
Um, but it's her lover, ex-husband, maybe current, I don't know. Um, but at the time, um, she st it starts out as a letter and she's writing him this letter and like actually asking questions. So in some ways, sometimes through the book, I then started thinking that maybe Casey wasn't her husband. Maybe it's a letter to all men and not just one person. Or maybe it was a letter to colonialism and it wasn't actually human. So I don't know. You can interpret it in so many ways, but more than likely I'm thinking too out of the box. She's, she's probably writing a letter to her lover and future husband. I knew I was not well. I thought of the first healer who was just a boy. My friend Denise told me the story. He called him Heartberry Boy, or she called him Heartberry Boy, or Odinamin. His name means strawberry in the language. Denise and I struggled and came up together. She named her son after the boy. The people in his village were sick and dying because the Indian world was shifting. The boy lost his mother. Odemin became a sorrowful kid who found solace in the dream world. He fell asleep and spun a restlessness that comes when people are waiting to die. Sometimes grief is a nothing feeling. <clears throat> Anyone who has gone through grief, and we all will at one point or more, um, I think can relate to that one sentence. Sometimes grief is a nothing feeling. The spirits finally came to him in a dream and told him to leave the village. He asked the elders what he should do, and they told him their own dreams and that he should introduce himself by name and lineage to a bear and follow her until she gave him a gift. He walked alone in the valley, and when bear presented herself, she stood tall. They looked at each other. He followed her. She sunk her paws into wet dirt and then he told her his name. She started to feel sick. Her heaving seemed bloody and reminded him of his mother. Bear told him she was not his mother. She told him to let her rest, but he didn't. She said, I can't unearth this medicine and give you power unless you give your life to this. She was willing to die to keep her secrets from weak people. He sat with her. She put her claws into strawberry pat into a strawberry patch and produced ripe berries. She ate and slept. He collected some berries and brought them to the people. Eventually he started to plant and show others what he learned. This was how the first medicine man came to be. And this was really interesting because um and I need to do some more research on her tribe. Honestly, I didn't do that before. Um this, and I should have. I could be totally wrong with her tribe because maybe it will say right here, Pacific Northwest. So yeah, Band of the Pacific. Seabird, okay, she's Seabird sea Island. It will tell you on the back of the book. Goodness, Jody. Um, so she's Seabird Island Band in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, but it's interesting because her word for strawberry is very close to our word for strawberry in the Anishinaabe language. And we have this a similar story, or maybe we should, I don't know. I need to do some research. Um, because strawberries to us are also known as heartberries and it's shaped like a heart. And there's been studies, scientific modern day studies that it is very, very good for your heart to eat strawberries. <clears throat> so of course, I'm sure that's how this came to be the title of her book. Um, but I thought that was really cool. Okay. Well, let's go on. Okay, I'm skipping to page 17. I'm tired of the constant stories and the truth. <clears throat> I don't acknowledge. They're not medicine anymore. I'm not medicine anymore. The words are flaccid, and the things I used to find sacred are torment. I'm stepping into my own undertow. My own valley is closing in on me. I curl into walls, ashamed at my cowardice. I am sick or possessed. 
So this is probably at the point she's having what some would call like a nervous breakdown or a psychotic break. Um, and I, I can relate to this. Um, before I was diagnosed with PTSD, I literally thought I was dying. Um, I even prepared a will, even though like the doctors couldn't find out, they said, nothing is wrong with you. Like there's no reason. I was so incredibly tired, exhausted. My body hurt, constant migraines. Um, I felt nauseated and sick all the time. Um, and then my doctor, she, I, I just found the right doctor and she gave me a quiz and she was like, um, you have PTSD. There's no question about it. Um, and at that point I was like, yeah, yeah, I think I do. You know, but hearing the terms, like I only thought that people who had been in combat or, you know, had had like, um, a horrible trauma, like, I don't know, a break in or something. I didn't think it was from what I had been through. But then after going through years of therapy, I've been through quite a bit, as well as so many others. And I can relate when Therese talks about this. Um, just, I don't even want to acknowledge. They're not medicine anymore. I'm not, I am not medicine anymore. The words are flaccid. It explained exactly how I felt during that time. And for some reason, my mind interpreted it as a physical pain rather than a heart pain. And um, and I think that's why I love this book so much because I can, she is able to put into words how I felt. And I wonder if you have the same interpretation or feeling or experience when you read this. So drop it in the comments. Okay, let's keep going. Um, the spirits used to possess the people. We called it Indian sick. And it was the first illness to be accounted for. It begins with want, with taking, and ends with a silence that hurts and makes us beg. There were stories about the cures and causes. Women tried to eat soap berries or nothing and talked about how we all had it coming. When the first children died, it was too late to stop talking. When the beings took the women, they bound them in blood. They were buried in wombs of sad memory. The only thing, the right thing, the thing that brought about our immunity was the knowledge that something instinctual would carry us back. The awareness that our ancestors were watching was vital. I don't feel the eyes of my grandmother anymore. What I feel, <clears throat> what I feel struck with is something smaller in a less impressive world. I woke up today confused inside of something feminine and ancestral in its misery. I woke up as the bones of my ancestors locked in government storage. My illness has carried me into white buildings, into the doctor's office and the therapist with nothing to say other than I need my grandmother's eyes on me, smiling at my misguided heart. Imagine their faces when I say that. I, I remember when I first read that, that's when I first cried. <clears throat> because I felt that way, but it, it was with my, my grandfather when he passed away. He and I were very, very close. <clears throat> and um, he's where I get um, a lot of my old stories from. My Anishinaabe stories are from him. Um, and then I felt this way again when my mom and dad died. So, and then trying to talk to my therapist about it, who, who doesn't understand she's very white, but I live in a very, very small, very white town now. And, um, luckily I have a therapist that didn't understand at first, but she educated herself. So now I feel like I can talk to her more about this stuff. <clears throat> The part that struck that was, I need my grandmother's eyes on me, smiling at my misguided heart. It's that it made me feel like, you know, those giants in our life that even when you make a mistake or you falter or you fall or you do something, you know, that's embarrassing, you could always look up at those giants in your life and they would smile back and then, you know, cheer you on as you got back up. And that's what it may, it reminded me of. 
And that's why I had to take a break and, and cry it out a little bit the first time I read it. Um, remember that tears hold power, so don't hold them in. That was some of the greatest advice my grandfather ever gave me. Um, tears hold power, don't hold them in. Otherwise it can destroy you. So, <clears throat> okay, let's continue. I am skipping to page 29 now. Um, okay, Terry is a friend of hers. Um, and so, just so you know when I say this name. So Terry explains self-esteem and its function. And I blame my mother for not saying these things. My mother wasn't big on esteem for herself, let alone trying to foster that in me. I think self-esteem is a white invention to further separate one person from another. It asks people to assess their value and implies people have worth. It seems like an identity capitalism. I found this really interesting. I never thought about it that way. Is self-esteem a colonial invention? Is it something there to separate us? Is it something that native people or just different tribes even worried about? Did everybody know their worth back before colonialism? I, I'm really curious about that. And by Therese saying that, I'm really, really curious. Um, so I'd really like to know your thoughts about that. I, I don't know, um, but it's really interesting. Okay, mom did teach me story, though along with Grandpa Crow, she knew what was my power. She knew women need their power honed early before it's beaten out of them by the world. I know what you're thinking, Casey. Again with my mother? Yes, unfortunately, that's the biggest part of my work in this place. <clears throat> by this time, she's writing letters to Casey because she's institutionalized. The therapist seems to think she's a link in my betterment. I think she did the best she could with the tools she had. The therapist says that's making excuses. Sometimes she had to lock herself away from the world. That's all. I have fond and bitter memories of her. I can't imagine what she'd think of me being here. My mother would have laughed at me. She'd have rolled in laughter and thrown her head back in my, in my misery. She believed in subversion and turning things upside down. She mocked everything. My desire to be normal or sincere made her laugh. So I found the part where the therapist is don't give your says don't give your mother excuses. And I wonder if they just teach all therapists to say that because <laughs> my therapist says that a lot. You're just giving excuses. And I think it's because we have that tie to our parents. You know, our parents can do no wrong. Our parents know everything. It's not until we're, you know, young teenagers or about that age where we're like, maybe my parents don't know everything, but we still protect them. I remember, <clears throat> I don't talk about this much. So, um, I was, I'm very close to my dad. I was very, very close to him growing up. There were certain times where I hated him though. Um, I knew that my dad would lay down his life for me without a doubt. I knew it. But then on the other hand, I was terrified of him. Um, he could also hurt me so deeply physically and emotionally. So it's, those same hands that could roll up and hit me were the same hands I felt safe in. So I understand. And then we give excuses. Well, he had a bad childhood. So at least my childhood was better than his. I would tell my, my mother would tell me that all the time to excuse him. And then even as an adult, I still give those excuses. I still love him, you know? And I always will, like that's never gonna change. Um, even after death, uh, there's still that search for accountability, I guess. Okay, let's continue on. Okay, it's getting dark, so I had to turn my light on. Okay, so now, I wanna start, I wanna go back to the 31, okay. My mother's burning ceremony was irreverent like her, 
We had plates of smoked salmon and things our grandparents liked to eat, ready for the fire to take. And I heard someone joke they would put some wine in for Karen. The fire exploded across the lawn and people said that it was mom. It was that night I felt compelled to resist all the traditionalism of my mother because I'm not sure how it served her children. She hated alcohol and stopped drinking before I was born. She was a pipe carrier and fasted alone in the mountains anytime she had to. Being a pipe carrier is a big deal, so it's kind of cool that her mom was a pipe carrier. Um, it takes a lot of ceremony, a lot of fasting, a lot of vision questing. Anyway, so she was a pipe carrier and fasted alone in the mountains anytime she had to. She built a sweat lodge by herself. She taught my brothers how to keep a fire and taught me how to prepare a feast. She spent years of my life waking up with the day to give thanks to the river. I never understood her commitment to living well. It seems innate that I am fucked up. I think I have the blood memory of my neurotic ancestors and their vices. Her work seems as important as my work to acknowledge that some of my people slept in and wasted their lives and were gluttonous. For her burial, my brothers and I walked her ashes in a cedar box from the church to the grave. Dogs lingered behind the party. My aunt says at every funeral, there are some cultures where women are paid to wail, are revered for wailing better than others. There's a culture that makes crying a virtue and a gift. I felt like mom's funeral lasted a year. It felt like one long winter where my family told every story of hers by memory as if it were being as if it were being interrogated my mother's spirit loomed over us imploring us to avenge her death but there were too many culprits from the government to the reservation to her own family to whoever hurt her the very first time i saw in pictures that between 13 and 14 my mother changed that culprit and then all our fathers and the men who said they were down for the cause and then abandoned it like they did their children. Those men killed my mother. Even the sweet lovers who gave her hope are the culprits of her pain. Um, that's, I mean, it's so deep. I don't even really have words for that. I mean, when we think our mother's pain it almost hurts us more to think of our mothers in pain or to think of all the people who allowed pain to happen. And even though we're the children, we still, I don't know, it's interesting how we want to protect our parents and especially our mothers from any kind of pain. Um, so I'd like to know if you have any words for that. I mean, how did that make you feel? Um, what experience do you have? Um, okay. Moving on, page 34. So this was interesting and um, uh, it drives home the fact that Native women, especially young Native women, are so sexualized and put into this Hollywood stereotype and phenotype. And um, and used and abused and just spit out. And this is kind of proof of that. So Teresa's mom was a bit of an activist and um, she also had a, basically a lover. Um, I don't know who he is, I probably should Google it. His name was Saul, uh -huh, Saul something, Sal Salvador. Anyway, if you've read the book, you know who I'm talking about. Um, and apparently he was a huge activist. Maybe he was Cuban, I, I don't know. Anyway, um, he was an activist put into prison, but Teresa's mom kept writing letters and it was like this huge love story. Anyway, Paul Simon, you know the musician Simon and Garfunkel? Yeah, okay, he comes into the story. Paul Simon called while I was watching TV. Our landline was screwed into the old 70s wood panel of our kitchen wall. I was ashamed of the house. The room was barren. There was an orange thrift shop dinette set. I think we probably have the same one. 
and shrine on our counter for Stevie Ray Vaughan. It was a picture of him surrounded by barks and sage my mother picked with red ties and turquoise jewelry. The bracelets and rings were given were gifts from my uncle Lyle, a jeweler who idolizes Elvis and wore a bouffant until a old age turned it into a less voluminous side part. Mom was in the bath. Paul's voice was timid. He asked for mom. I yelled to her that Paul was on the phone, um, on the phone line. Mom told me to keep him on the phone while I heard her body emerge, splashes and her small wet feet running. So, yeah, so he called because he basically wanted her story for a musical he was writing, right? So she spends all this time, he gets the story in this huge musical, makes a ton of money, okay? Simon gave us a choice, American dollars or a family trip to New York. Julia Roberts attended the opening. A woman who would later star in Grey's Anatomy played my mom. We missed the opportunity to see it all to buy school clothes. Mom spent the rest on bills, food, and things. This part, it, it's hard to not get bitter at it, right? Because she gave him this story and all of this time and her love letters to and from her lover in prison, who's an activist. And um, this was it. And I bet you, I, I don't watch Grey's Anatomy, but I bet you there's no Native Americans in it. If I'm wrong, let me know. Drop it in the comments. Um, and I should Google this. I really should Google more. Uh-huh. Um, but I, I bet you it wasn't a native that played Teresa's mom. I'm going to have to Google that after and see what's up. I could have redeemed her, like my words on the page, like I would have myself believe articulating her grace and pain could be redemptive. I didn't want Paul Simon to be my father, but I wanted him to save us. More than a few thousand, I wanted him to see us and decide we were worth a play in our own right. I wanted him to see my mother beyond a groupie or a cliche or an Indian woman because she was more. He didn't see her. The play reduced mom to an Indian hippie chick. A variety's Greg Evans called her a prison groupie and I had only known her as an outreach worker. Prison was part of that getting them to write or draw to find sanity in isolation. I'm trying not to make excuses because she did fall. It's in the text and on my mind every day how she fell. It could be like Eve. The old texts say we get menses for the fall, feel pain for the fall. God couldn't watch it. He sent us his boy, but I doubt he watched his son die. I think he just waited for him on the other side. You know, Again, there's just, she's putting into words what I have failed to do so much. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to know what you think about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, how often do Indian women, women especially, how often do you see them portray actual, how often do you see Native American roles in Hollywood? or in Broadway, actually played by real Native American women. They're usually played by people of Vietnamese descent or um, Armenians. Uh, yeah, so, and that's why when people like look at me or they look at other Native Americans, they're like, you're not Native because we don't fit the Hollywood stereotype. And you know, this is why. Anyway, so <clears throat> moving on, I'm on page 66. We're kind of cruising through this because I really want to know how you feel. So I'm just reading you prompts and some points that struck out at me. But if I don't read a part in the book that really struck a chord with you, please let me know. You can just let me know what page it is or you can, you know, copy and paste the excerpt into your comment because I'd really like to know what you got from this book because it's so deep and so raw. Okay, so I'm on page 66. <clears throat> we found solace in getting drunk together at your bar. I told you that I wanted to be chosen. You explained that you were sorry. You told me that you chose me. After last call, you told the doorman that we were going to make a baby in a pecan field. We both stumbled on dirt roads to pick the most lush and soft field. 
We couldn't stop laughing. I believed on this occasion. I was two inches taller than I had ever been. My body was rushing with newness and safety. You laid your coat down and it was too dark for us to be soft and prepared. I saw your eyes and smiled before you kissed mine closed. We knew there would be a baby, as sure as we knew our love felt impossible and necessary. The truth of this story is, deta is a detailed thing. When I would preferred it to be a symbol or a poem, fewer words and more strikingly images to imbue all our things, I can't turn it into a Salish art. I had to fill these pages with stories of our new family because the merging was so complicated, even I was confounded. I had to write full sentences and the exposition lent itself to the dialogue and there can't be ambiguity, uh -huh, ambiguity <clears throat> in the details of the story. For you and our child and my sons, I see what happened up and down on the page. Because if my sons want to see how terrible our love was and why we chose it, they can see as closest here. So they made a baby. Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting because she talks about how she can explain their, their terrible, clearly codependent relationship to their child and hope that they have peace is kind of how I interpreted that. Um, that even though their relationship was terrible, there was still these moments of pure love and safety and kindness and respect. And so kind of to have the children focus on that um, instead of all the terrible parts. So <clears throat> this is kind of what made her start going downhill. Plus, um, her, they end up getting married. He has an affair. She can't, and it's just a whole, and she can't go, she can't stay on her mental health medication while she's pregnant. So it's this whole downward spiral and she ends up back into an institution. Um, I want to read you this. I couldn't distinguish the symptoms from my heart. It was polarizing to be told there was a diagnosis for the behaviors. I felt justified in having. And then I knew some part of my disease was spiritual or inherited. I had not stopped wanting to die. It was not romantic because it felt passionless, like a job I hated and needed. Romanticism requires bravery and risk. The obsessive thoughts ruin things. Good news was met with a numb feeling. The voice I heard was practical. It noted every opportunity to die and then noted how I refused to jump out of a moving car. I refused to take all the pills I could find. I refused to drink myself to death. I refused to cut my pregnant body. I refused to buy a gun. I refused to crash my car and I refused to jump from a spaghetti interchange. I was aware of every opportunity I missed. I remembered when I thought I could go through with it. I remember being caught slumped against my bathroom door. My friend stuck his finger inside my throat until I purged. I remember waking up with blood and bile in my mouth. My friend said that he just knew I wasn't okay. It was strange because I didn't know I had called him several times crying before that. And I can't remember how I had such conviction that day. I was not right to want to die. I didn't want to leave my family. I liked my mind and its potential. I knew the type of burden I was. I was like my mother. I have tried not to call her my mother. I started to believe that a person cannot own land or a family member. So I, I have been there where every second, every moment of the day, I just wanted to die. Um, and that was the, the part I was mentioning earlier um, before I was diagnosed with PTSD. Every second of the day, I wanted to die. And, and I remember thinking the same thing, like, I, I don't want to die. I don't want, I didn't want to leave my family. 
I did like my mind. I liked the potential. I liked my dreams at one point. And, but I felt like such a burden um, in so many ways. And that's a whole nother book that I don't know I'll ever, ever write. But um, yeah, I felt like such a burden on my children and my husband. It was intense. It was incredibly intense. Um, I'm so thankful for the mental health help I have received here. Um, they literally saved my life. If it wasn't for that one doctor who was like, let's take this test and see if it's something else um, besides something physical. So anyway, when I read that, I was like, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about, Therese. Yeah. And I, I'm glad you were able to get help in the hospital. Um, for anyone who feels like this, if you're feeling that like that right now, please reach out to someone. Um, because I promise you it won't last forever and I promise you things will get better. Okay, so now I'm moving on to page 80. Therese is pregnant. She's going through a really hard time. She's without her meds. She knows her husband's having an affair um, and she's pregnant. In the next weeks, our baby in my womb reminded me of my brother, Guy Wheel, willful and scared. He kicked before the doctors predicted he would. He hiccuped each night at 11. I believed my mother spoke to our baby in my sleep. I think they devised a way to punish me for even thinking that a thunder being inside of me could be bad. For a hundred days, it felt like baby guy was crawling out of my throat. I heaved until my face became blotchy. We believed it was an allergic reaction, but our doctor said it was blood vessels bursting from the strain of puking so often and so hard. No pill worked against the nausea. I realized after looking at my silhouette, seeing our small person expanding my reflection, that pain didn't burn me. Trying to forget damaged me the most. Your eye has long since healed. I chose to be lethargic instead of angry in the last months of our pregnancy. Each night I rested my head in your lap and you placed your hand on my stomach. He kicked you and I felt my mother raising her hands to me the way Salish women do in ceremony to say thank you. When the day came, I wasn't sure I was in pain enough because the baby had conditioned me so well. We went to the hospital anyway and Casey Guyweo was cut out from me, larger than he should have been. His skin is milk and his body feels electric and unforgiving. He seems like the child my brothers, my sister and I could have been. That part, it still gets me when I read it to see like you're a newborn infant and they're so innocent, the world hasn't touched them yet. And if you come from trauma, um, we're taught in therapy to go back to the child and that you could protect. And it's one of the hardest lessons in therapy to go through. And hopefully you have a really good therapist when you do that. And um, I feel that's kind of what she was doing at this point. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts or your interpretation. I remember when both my kids were born, two totally different experiences. Um, wouldn't change it for anything. Um, but the first one was pretty traumatic. It, I won't go into detail, but we both almost died. It was crazy. And it, and I didn't, you know, I was in and out. So I don't remember a whole lot right after. Um, but she, my daughter truly became like my soul child. Uh, she and I are still best friends. She lives in a different state. Um, she just graduated with her master's. Yay, congratulations. Um, and she, like we talk every day, she's my best friend. Um, she's my soul child. Our son, when he was born, it was a scheduled C-section because I had some complications, super easy pregnancy, like, I loved being pregnant with him, super easy. Had a C-section, I was able to touch his face right after. And just that, that milky, they, oh, so soft. And oh my goodness, 
so yeah, when our kids are born and you first get to see them, they're untouched by the world yet. And um, hopefully the first voice they hear is yours and the first you know, face they see is yours. It, it always can't happen, but anyway, let's focus. Okay, so now I'm on page 82. Um, <clears throat> As an Indian woman, I resist, resist the urge to bleed out on a page to impart the story of my drunken father. It was dangerous to be alone with him, as it was dangerous to forgive, as it was dangerous to say he was a monster. If he were a monster, that would make me part monster, part Indian. It is my politic, politic to write the humanity in my characters and subvert the stereotypes. Isn't that my duty as an Indian writer? But what part of him was subversion? <clears throat> my therapist asked me to speak to my father and mother in a session. I told my father that a bird is just a bird. A mother is a tangible thing. Making Indian women inhuman is a problem for me. We've become too symbolic and never real enough. My therapist asked me to speak to my mother and I couldn't. <coughs> Excuse me, allergies. I swear, they get worse every year and it doesn't matter, spring, summer, fall, but spring and summer are the worst. So I apologize. Anyway, my father was soft looking sometimes. I liked to sleep in the crook of his neck. He smelled like Old Spice and bergamot. His hands shook when he was not drinking, at his worst. And when I held his hands, he seemed thankful. He delighted in my imagination. The grass was always high in our lawn, and he often let me use the hose to fill buckets and wash tires. I pretended it was a snake. My mother wanted to heal him. I remember several trips to visit him in rehab. She sent him to islands, and I remember wearing a life jacket, crossing water to somewhere in Tofino, British Columbia. I remember each hope given to me by my mother that our father would be okay and things would be different. In the past, I wanted to tell her that some things can't be loved away, but I think she knew that. Um, the way that she describes her dad reminded me of my dad, Old Spice, um, being afraid to be alone with him, but also feeling most at home in the crook of his neck. And when I held his hands, he seemed thankful. And uh, having a mother who wanted to heal him, thinking it was her job, that her sacrifice was her duty. Um, and I think that's a lot of women, especially from um, the boomer or silent generation. Um, they the roles are really weird like mothers sacrificed everything and my parents were like right on the cusp of boomers and um the silent generation and wow yeah um mothers did absolutely everything i don't know how my mother did it she worked she was a nurse and then she was the administrator for my dad's business she and then she was like um she did all of our dance costumes. She made everybody, she was, she did everything. Our house was always immaculate and she made, I don't know how she did it and stayed sane. I would have been ripping off heads. Yeah, that doesn't happen in my household. Just so you know. Yeah, no super mom here. Um, but it was so expected then and it's just insane to me. Um, dads worked and they had no other responsibilities. They brought home the money and that was it. And it's just like, no wonder there was a Valium epidemic in, yeah. Anyway, um, so then Teresa's dad dies. And of course, this is another big blow for her. She says his smell was not monstrous, nor the crooks of his body. The invasive thought that he died alone in a hotel room is too much. It is dangerous to think about him. 
as it was dangerous to have him as my father, as it is dangerous to mourn someone I fear becoming. I don't write this to put him to rest, but to re resurrect him as a man, when public record portrays him as a drunk, a monster, and a transient. I wish I could have known him as a child, in his newness. I want to see him with the sheen of perfection, with skin unscathed by his mistakes or by his father's. It's in my nature to love him, and I can't love who he was, but I can see him as a child. Before my mother died, I asked her if he had ever hurt me. I put you in double diapers, she said. There's no way he hurt you. Did he ever hurt you? No, I said. If rock is permeable in water, I wonder what that makes me in all of this. There is a picture of my brother Ovi and me next to dad's van. My chin is turned up and the bottom of my irises. There is brightness. My brother had his hand on his hip and he looks protective standing over me. I know without remembering clearly that my mother took this picture and that we loved each other. I don't think I can forgive myself for my compassion. There's so many levels on all of this. I love it. Um, I remember when my dad died and he died alone as well, but it was, it was different. He wasn't a transient. He, my dad and I had made up, um, and he became my giant again as an adult. Unfortunately, he died when I was 28. So it was too young. Um, but I, he passed when we were friends and we put a lot of our past, you know, we'd forgiven, I'd forgiven him and he finally started to understand me. So we, when he, when he left, we left on a good note, but he did die alone and it, it haunts you. It, it does. Um, but that's the way he wanted to go. Um, but then, yeah, I don't think I can forgive myself for compassion. It's one of those, it's a double-edged sword, right? Especially to forgive someone who has hurt you so deeply. And there's, if you don't forgive, you've always got that na nagging little part of you that tells you you need to. And if you do forgive, you've got that other little part of you that's like, why did you forgive? So and I can understand what she's talking about there. Um, let you know, let me know what you thought about that. Okay. Um, I'm on page 107, Thunder being honey bear. I avoid the mysticism of my culture. My people know there is a true mechanism that runs through us. Stars were people in our continuum. Mountains were stories before they were mountains. Things were created by stories. The words were conjurers and ideas were our mothers. Thunder is contrary. Thunder can inuit into it. And her action is the music caused by lightning. She comes because we ask. And that's why falling apart is holy. I, I really loved this part. She comes because we ask. And that's why falling apart is holy. I don't know why that like, like so deep into my soul when I read that. I can't explain why. That's why falling apart is holy. Maybe it's because at our lowest points, that's when we're searching. Maybe that's when we actually listen to our ancestors and the spirits. I don't know. I'd really like to know what your interpretation is that of that. People said I came from thunder. I thought the quick chaos was my master. My dreams were about a spinning wheel, symbols of an unstoppable force that would ruin me. I was a child when I told my mother there was a large wheel in my dreams. She asked me what I did when I saw it. I watched, I said. She looked at me carefully that day. She took out her paints and drew a thunderbird on a white poster board. Before the paint dried, I put my finger on its blue chest. 
Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, so I'm on page 118. Let's see. <coughs> okay, I'm on page 118. This story is yours, culprit of my pain. Which one of us is asking for mercy? What do you even want with my sorrow? You are so inefficient with pain. I realized you never had to cultivate it the way I did, the way Indian women do. You think weakness is a problem. I want to be torn apart by everything. My people cultivated pain and the way that God cultivated his garden with a foresight that he could not contain or protect the life within. Humanity was born out of pain. I learned how to abstain from good things. I didn't expect the best things, and I have turned loss into a fortune, a personal pleasure. It's not a sustainable joy, I know. I've seen you happy. Being close to your joy has been a measured success. I've somehow retained myself after all of this with you, retained the ability to revel in loss. This loss has spun and twisted itself into silk. My sons will hold to their faces. I almost killed myself trying to match your potential joy. It was taking my misery. The thing I am most familiar with, the thing I rove into love. I realized that I could have you and the pain. Pain expanded my heart. Pain brought me to you, and our children have blood memories of sorrow and your joy, too. They inherited their share to cultivate their own children, whose humanity and gentleness will remind them of you and me. Our boys, their compassion to will away inherited sorrow. It's what makes them good and mine and Indian. Had I not been born and cultivated in this history, I wonder how dim and dumb my life would be. I feel fortune with this education and all these horrors and you. Today in front of a slew of white authors, during a fellowship with a drink in my hand, I said that I was untouchable. There was a gasp and maybe it was a hundred years of work for my name to arrive here where I can name my pain so well that people are afraid of the consequences and power. That was so incredibly deep. So in a way she's saying, I can't let go of my pain. When I try to ignore my pain and just like be happy, it destroys me. So how about I try to live with my pain and have it coincide with joy at the same time so that then I can show our children and they can have part of your joy as well and have their own story. That's how I interpreted that, but I'd like to know how you went with it. And then I love how, so here's this Indian woman, educated, beautiful, and she is in a fellowship and she pretty much tells these white authors that they can't touch her. And that was powerful right there. They are afraid of the consequences and power. Okay. So this last chapter, I'm going to read because it's, it's hard. It's only a couple pages, but I breaking it up, I don't think does it justice. Um, basically, I feel like she's coming to terms with her mother after her death. And so she's written her a letter. Mom, I won't speak to you the way we spoke before. We try to be explicit with each other. Some knowledge can only be a song or a symbol. Language fails you and me. Some things are too large. What of the body, Waskinak? What of your skin, that pine, and then the winter willow beneath? What of the hair, Waskinak? When you cut it, was it because he touched it? That is a type of mourning too. Or was it the manner of the touch? How much of your movements do I contribute to lack of love or the manner of it? There is the sentiment that love is radical from the very radicals you walked with. They say now that hate is the absence of love. It's poster fodder, 
I follow the logic to death. What of death, Washinak? It's not the absence of something, but a new thing. I would never resurrect you, but I know your sons, my sister, and I often will you in our sleep. You told us it was dangerous to travel in our dreams. I know. What of your death, Washinak? Was exacting hunger a type of satiation? The waste and hollow stomach in your soil? Is that what you wanted? I died hungry that day. Everyone's stomachs were thrown into your cedar box. All your children, still your responsibility. I hold my baby's head to my chest. The skin is the same as kissing a narrow stream. And even his hair feels perennial, without roots, just moving. Life is a running thing without roots for me. I'll take his stomach when I die and throat and he'll spend his life receiving better parts than I have not split. <clears throat> Do you know the reservation received your body like Christ or the Holy Ghost or the Father? Are you perpetua in the den? Was I the infant you tore from your chest before you walked toward the lion? Mother, can I know my inheritance now? Is the fall of man your story, Washneck? Not that you were born to a green world and trespassed, but were you born into the blood? Were you the corporal manifestation of a spirit world, your leather jacket and brown body and fist holy? God foreordained Eve's transgression. He didn't see you though. You were stealthier than Eve, so stealthy. There is no text of you until now. You are folklore and rumor and there is a myth a man took, like the apple, but of your person. If the fall was purposeful, then so are your transgressions. If there were no fall, there would, wouldn't have been an incarnation. To ascend, there must be a dark, a descent. Is that why, Washkinek, our fathers were prisoners? My brother doesn't talk about it, but I do. What of Salvador, your lover, Mom? I found his words in the underground presses and in old newspapers clips and in photos with brown rotting edges. Your limbs are there beneath his. You hadn't risen yet. You were just there turning water into wine for men. Salvador wrote, Que vivo wounded knee. And you wrote him back. He said his best weapon was his mouth and laughed. Governor Rockefeller commuted his death sentence and prolonged yours. Both of your mouths, weapons, both of you, writing from boxes, you from your island, Sal from a box in Attica. That's how love works for a spirit like you, a determined torture. Who would fault you? Did you come from misery? What of your mother's body, Washkinek? Her olive seed and the red hill earth beneath. How many times did she hold you back from the other side of the door? Do you know you left us hungry, Washkinek? We exacted hunger like you. When we were children, you came home and fed me bruised bananas. Was that trub substantiation? Did you see my sister's eyes like eaves at the gates of the garden? What do my eyes look like, I asked. I couldn't see. What of my body, mother? Do I write from pain like Hildegard? What of my body and the women who've left? My citrine and the bark beneath. When you met the serpent who was my father, what did his eyes look like? He painted you a drum. From his box, he wrote that he could not take care of you. What provocation to a spirit like you? Do you remember when you banished the serpent mom? that we all waited by the door with weapons in our hands. <clears throat> in the root of my mind, which is contained like our old house and formed just so, I see you lying down against the concrete and my father standing above you. I walk backwards up the steps, knowing my feet like I never did. Do I forgive you both? We shine brighter in heaven. You are formless to me now but still your pine and winter willow are in my body, as are my grandmother's olive seed and red 
heal earth. I am leaving your body in the earth, mother. My words lay still like shadows on the page, but they are better than nothing, better than your formless looming and the dead men who left you. I lament and lament the beginning until the end, where your red hands are waiting. Did you foreordain heaven before you died? Was I there on your chest? Or did you hold me from the door? That was the end. So if you haven't read it, you need to read this book. It is one of my favorites. I still need to do more research because I want to understand her a little bit more um, and where she's from. I'm really interested to see if there's a connection between her tribe and mine, which would be interesting because my people are from, you know, the Northeast, like up into Canada, Michigan, that area. So um, it'd be really interesting if there's a connection, but I'm going to look. Our words are very similar. Maybe we're in the same language group. I don't know. Um, so I need to check that out. Um, I want to do some more research on her mom. Um, but I think the story is more than that. I think she wants... I think clearly she had to get her pain onto paper and in a way that was breaking a cycle for her. She talks about her kids so much and I think getting her pain down onto paper was so healing for her and she needed to do it for her children. Um, you can tell she really wants her children to not be touched the way that she was in so many ways. So I really feel that she she did this for her children. Um, if she can, and I feel, I think that's why like therapists always tell us you should journal. Um, there's something about getting your pain or your feelings or your experiences out on paper that it leaves your heart in a sense. So it's not so heavy on you. And it does in a sense. Um, so I think that's what Teresa is doing here. And I think that's the important thing, not to get facts out of this book, but to get the feelings and the experience and identify with certain parts so that maybe I mean it was very healing for for me um she clearly had so many different experiences that are different from mine um I can't imagine um in some places but I could also identify in so many others it was um refreshing is a horrible word um maybe reaffirming that I'm not alone and that your experiences have value. But then also, oh my gosh, I just love how this is so incredibly poetic. Uh, it's like one giant poem and her analogies are incredible. Like I understand why she gets awards because her writing is like no other writing I've ever read before. Um, and it's raw, like down to the bone raw. So I really love this bo book. I can see how it could be triggering, triggering for some people. So um, if you have PTSD or you, you know, you're, you're a victim of alcoholism or abandonment or um, sexual abuse, you know, you just might make sure you're not alone or like if it gets too much, put it down. Uh, but from my experience... It wasn't triggering at all. I mean, I I got emotional, of course, and I would have to just stop for a second and give me a second to breathe. But um, then I would go right back into it because I wanted to see what she had to say next. Uh, so everybody's experience is going to be different. But I would really love to know your interpretations of this book. And let's discuss. Drop it in the comments. Um, I'm going to be taking off... Uh, the summer because we're going to be traveling and I just want to spend more time with my kids. My, my daughter just is, she's graduating with her master's degree. I think I said earlier. And so I, I'll be spending some time with her. Um, so yeah. And I haven't, you know, I haven't seen her for 10 months. Holy cow. So I'll be, I just want to concentrate on her, but I am probably going to do a video next week. Um, and just show you all my reading list. And then I'll start back up the, the, the book club um, in the fall. 
So I'll give you the list of books so that if you want to join me in the fall, you can get the books too. And then we'll just have our, you know, at least we'll be ahead on um, our book club because this was fun and I'd really like to start, you know, keep it going. It's been great for me and I hope you've had a great experience too. So make sure to drop your comments and we will discuss. I'll put um, where you can get this book. If you don't have it already, I'll put this in the description um, down below. I hope you've had a wonderful week and I'll put in one more video before I check out for the summer, um, for the summer by me, like two months. Okay. Um, and so I hope you have a wonderful week. Thanks for spending this time with me. It means so much to me. And so be safe, have a great summer. I'll see you next week. Um, so it's not quite summer break for us yet. Okay. You take care. Chi miigwech. For every Indigenous Author Monday video that I put out, I am dedicating it to the One Shelf Project put on by Gadakana. Gadakana is an Indigenous organization, a 501c3 nonprofit, tax deductible organization that provides books in their local libraries that are actually accurate historically accurate, and by Indigenous authors, both fiction and nonfiction. And their goal is to at least have a shelf dedicated to Indigenous accurate information in their local libraries. They can only do this with help through donors, and they need your help. I will put the link down here, so please check them out, The One Shelf Project another organization near and dear to my heart. Get back to me.